Mr Tommy Shepherd. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, it's a pleasure as ever to follow the Honourable Member for Cookbridge Question and Bells Hill. Um, I want to look forward in this debate, but to do that I have to first of all look backwards. The Act of Union of 1707 gave protection to many aspects of Scottish life. In our churches, our classrooms and our courts, uh, things were preserved. That aside, though, that act of union led to the creation of a single unitary state with a centralised government apparatus. It was not a federation. It was not a partnership. It was not even, in the proper sense, a union at all, but the creation of a single polity into which Scotland was subsumed. And I believe that that represents a central weakness, a fragility, of the United Kingdom, which has been exposed in the time since. And all of what has transpired in terms of this debate about devolution and decentralisation should be seen in this context of the imperfections of the United Kingdom and the ability to try and compensate for them so that the state can represent the aspirations and needs of the people in Scotland. Now, that didn't matter so much in the early days, but throughout the 19th century, government expanded rapidly so that by the end of the 19th century, there was a demand for decentralisation, and we saw the creation in 1885 of the Scottish Office and the position of Secretary of State for Scotland. But it wasn't until the 20th century that the demand came for political decentralisation, for devolution, for constitutional change, and the Home Rule movement at the beginning of the 20th century, widely reflected in Scotland, in fact leading to the passage in this chamber of the Act of Government in Scotland, 20, uh, 1913, almost 100 year, more than 100 years ago, uh, uh, embodying some Home Rule for Scotland. That didn't, wasn't enacted, of course, because of the advent of the First World War and economic disruption and further world wars meant that the debate did not re, uh, re, get rejoined until uh, the 1950s. And then we were in a completely new world. The old order had changed utterly. Empires were disintegrated and almost every couple of months a new nation state was being formed somewhere in the globe. So actually the demands of Scottish nationalism, the demands for Scottish self-government became not cast in the past with some romantic notions of pre-Union days. They became a very contemporary pr uh, proposition, very much in touch with the modern world. Typified, I think, in the 1967 uh, Hamilton by-election when Winnie Ewing said, stop the world, Scotland wants to get on. And the 50 years since then have been a series of reports from Kilbrandon to Smith and a series of bills which have been all about trying to dissipate and placate the demands for self-government from the people of Scotland. Now, the central paradox is this, Mr Speaker, that despite all of what has happened, it seems that that, uh, that placation has not taken place. And I can understand why unionists must be extremely frustrated. The old dictum of Enoch Powell that power devolved is power retained doesn't appear to be the case. And they must be tearing their hair out thinking, what more do they have to do for these rebellious Scots to be satisfied? If you look at the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey, you will find, in terms of attitudes to the Scottish Parliament, that just about 8 to 10 per cent of people think there should be no Scottish Parliament at all. But once you discount those people, that very small minority, a clear majority of the remain remainder believe that the Scottish Parliament should be independent rather than part of the constitutional arrangements of the United Kingdom. So why has this happened? I think it's happened for two reasons. The first is that devolution has been a resounding success. It has led to perceptible benefits to people of Scotland, to changes in how lives are lived, which people really appreciate. Now, others have said, uh, and across the chamber, uh, they've talked about the achievements of the Scottish Parliament and, and Scottish Government, so I'm not going to repeat them, although I do want to make it clear that I don't regard these as being the preserve of any one political party. I am proud of the last 12 years of the SNP, Scottish Government, but I acknowledge fully the progress that was made by the Labour and Liberal Democrat coalition in the first two terms of the Scottish Parliament. But the fact is that many people have now come to, uh, to be open to the idea that if some devolution can make positive changes to their lives, then why not just devolve everything and take all of the powers that we need to run our affairs in Scotland? The second reason why 
dis the, the opinion and the demand for self-government hasn't been dissipated is because the process of exercising power throws into sharp relief the powers you do not have. Yeah. And this yep. is now a very raging argument in Scotland. People see that there are things that could be made yep. better, but we don't have the competence and capacity to be able to yep. do it. To give a, a few brief examples, we want to reduce carbon emissions in Scotland. The Scottish Government is committed now to having an all-electric road system with charging points throughout the entire country. But it is powerless to try and shift the transition to electric vehicles because there is no control over vehicle excise duty. We might want to give incentives to small businesses in Scotland and start-ups in key sectors of the economy, but we have no power at all over corporate taxation. From drugs to, to, to broadcasting, from food standards to employment law, there are many, many aspects of life that could be improved, but we don't have the powers to do so. Now, that adumbration is not by itself a compelling argument for independence, because we could respond to that lack of competence by further devolution. Although it is a mystery to me, Mr Speaker, that many of the proponents of devolution who got us to this point in many ways now seem to think it's time to pull up the drawbridge, that actually devolution is complete, the process yes. is over, there is nothing that can possibly be added to it. And so they vote against every amendment that we bring to legislation to try and increase the powers for the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. And it is this obstinacy, this refusal to see devolution as a process that is still continuing that is fueling the appetite for independence because people think, well, perhaps that is the only way to take these powers to ourselves. So this is what is uh, happening. Uh, uh, I'm just checking my notes for once. <laughs> but, uh, ah, but Mr Speaker, the other point is this. But when we talk about devolution of powers, there is another role for the state to play, and that is to represent the character and intention of the people who live within its boundaries. And it is in this respect that independence provides an answer that devolution cannot. And there are many, many people in Scotland now, more every day, who question whether the British state is able to articulate their views and yep. their character, mm -hmm. either in this country or abroad. And that has been turbocharged that change by Brexit and by the growth of right-wing English nationalism, so that we are in a situation now where many, many more people than before are open to the prospect of Scottish independence. Um, Mr Speaker, there was much more I wanted to say, but I appreciate that you want us to try and be brief. But let me finish by this point. I think it will be for history to judge whether devolution has succeeded in sustaining the British state and the United Kingdom as a constitutional set of arrangements by trying to remove its imperfections, or whether in fact it will be seen in history as a step along the way to full self-government. We have to wait and see what the outcome is. But the important thing, Mr Speaker, is that that decision is not a matter for me or for you. That is a decision for the people who live in yeah, Scotland yeah, to take. Yeah, yeah. And my party's pledge to the people of Scotland is that we will take on all comers and meet all resistance in order to allow the people of Scotland to make that decision. And I believe they will get the opportunity to do that in a very short space of time. Order. Two years to the day since the delivery of his May 